I um, was a colleague with him in that I was the Australian Foreign Minister while Jack was the UK Foreign Secretary and we were very much brothers in arms. We shared many views in common, not always sharing uh, the same opinions as the Americans had over one or two quite controversial issues that we had to deal with at the time, which we might bypass tonight. Um, but I first heard of Jack Straw when I was a student here in the UK back in the early 1970s, and he was the president of the National Union of Students at my university. I was the, this will surprise some of you, but I was the um, vice chairman of the University Conservative Association. And um, so in a different sort of world of politics from Jack in those days. Um, and, um, you know, he seemed to me to be very left-wing and very dangerous and a, and a force for evil in those days. But as the years wore on, I discovered that he was very much a force for good. Um, he was a great friend of my country and he became a great friend uh, to work with through some very difficult times. And I always appreciated um, his support. Then I remember he got moved from being Foreign Secretary to Leader of the House or something. I remember that. Um, and he rang me. Um, and I was sitting in my sitting room in Adelaide and the telephone rang and it was Jack and we had a very frank conversation about this move. I think I would go so far as to say he wasn't very happy about it. <laughs> but anyway, that's politics, of course. There are times when you, do, you feel you're doing really well and there are times when it doesn't seem to go so well. So the people who succeed in politics are the people who just hang in there. Um, as you might see with one or two characters here in the UK at the moment. So, Jack, I would like to hand over to you. Jack will talk to you for about 15 or 20 minutes or as long as he likes, within reason. Um, and, and then I will ask him some questions. This is our normal format. I'll have a discussion with him. And um, then we'll throw it open to the floor and we hope to get it all finished by about 7.30. We tried to finish more or less on time. So, Jack, over to you. Uh, thanks, Alexander, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out on a very wet uh, evening. Um, yeah, I was moved um, by uh, my friend Tony Blair um, after five years at the Foreign Office. Um, and um, my problem was he couldn't give, never gave me a proper explanation as to why he was moving me, because he had no complaints about how I was doing the job. So uh, anyway, and two weeks later, he said to me, I'm really, really sorry I moved you. Um, which is, and he, said, he actually put, had the good grace, because he's a good man, uh, to put that in his book. But you know, by then, it was kind of too late. Anyway, life moves on. Uh, and uh, here I am. But as Alexander said, um, I mean, when I was president of the National Union of Students, very, very responsible uh, president of the National Union of Students, we heard about these extremists in Newcastle Conservative Association. Uh, and particularly Alexander Downer. Uh, but it, I, I've just made that bit up, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, <clears throat> life does move on, and uh, Alexander and I had a, a brilliant working relationship uh, when he was foreign minister. And he was foreign minister for 12 years. Uh, uh, and I, I managed 13 years in government, but only been different jobs. Um, but um, I mean, one of the keys to successful diplomacy is building up levels of trust with your opposite numbers uh, and I mean it has to be real trust because uh, well it applies to those with whom you profoundly disagree because you need, I mean I, I spent a long time working with the Iranians and gradually got their trust in the sense that I wasn't going to blag about what they were saying to me um, but um, with allies um, particularly Australia it requires real levels of trust because, as Alexander said, um, although we were quotes all on the same side over Afghanistan and Iraq, um, that belied the fact that there were some really serious uh, difficulties. Um, and um, Alexander and I worked in tandem to try and <coughs> get uh, some of the um, uh, more erratic folk in the American administration uh, to follow the line that uh, our good friend uh, Colin Powell uh, was following, sometimes with success and sometimes with failure. Anyway, I will speak for uh, 15 minutes. I've got my watch in front of me. Um, 
The Chinese leadership have often referred to the period before the Communist Revolution of 1949 as their century of humiliation. But China now has great power, economic and military, and indeed greater power than in any period in the industrial age, the last three centuries, uh, and that is likely to continue. For Russia, we are still in their century of humiliation, which began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union two years later. And in the State of the Union, State of the Nation Address in 2005, uh, which he gave, President Putin said, and I quote, the demise of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century, and that was of the 20th century. For the Russian people, it became a genuine tragedy. Tens of millions of our fellow citizens and countrymen found themselves beyond the fringes of Russian territory. Now, I don't personally agree that uh, the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991 was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, and I think nor would tens of millions of people in the 17 nations that came out of the Soviet Union, um, which have been able to establish themselves as independent nations, agree with that view. But my view, and that of um, those tens of millions uh, in the uh, former Soviet Republic, uh, uh, my view of, and, th and theirs are irrelevant in considering this issue of uh, the Ukraine war. That view is what Putin believes. And as he has gained more and more power and removed those institutions and individuals which might challenge him, he has more and more become convinced that his personal destiny uh, and that of Mother Russia are completely intertwined. Now, Putin and his coterie are certainly uh, very greedy when it comes to material wealth, but it's a great error to believe that that's what motivates them principally. What drives them is an intense Russian nationalism, harking back not only to the Soviet Union, but in Putin's case, to imperial, uh, uh, to the, the Russian Empire of, of pre-1917. It's too easy, I think, to forget these days, 30 plus years uh, on, just how powerful the Soviet Union was seen by the West. In Putin's lifetime, even in his lifetime, and certainly in mine, uh, the Soviets were the first nation to launch a manned satellite into space in 1957, uh, much to the discomfiture of the United States. And I can still remember uh, at school, word going around uh, uh, about this. And what a, a, a sense of, of really humiliation, to use the same word, the Americans felt that the uh, Russians had pulled a, 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 a march on them. More significantly, in my view, in 1963, Labour's leader, Harold Wilson, as part of his campaign to prove that the Labour Party was the party of the future, made a much acclaimed conference speech in which he spoke of the imperative of harnessing the right, white heat of technology. The challenge, he said, is not going to come from the United States, it's not going to come from West Germany, it's not going to come from France, but he continued with any sense of irony, either from him, from, from his audience in the hall, or from the press, the challenge is going to come from Russia. Extraordinary idea these days, but that's his view, and that was the prevailing view. And the Soviet Union was second only to the United States in research and defense, in its economy, and in some areas it was top dog. Its collapse in 1991 resulted in Russia losing half its population, half its GDP, much of its defense capability, and that the chaos of the Russian economy in the Yeltsin years led to a complete collapse in defense spending too, down to about a quarter at one stage of what the Soviet Union uh, had been spending. Today, Russia does remain a formidable foe. It's got thousands of nuclear war warheads and launch capacity, thousands of tanks and legacy equipment dating back to the Soviet era. Altogether, it's got 850,000 personnel in its armed forces and associated services. All that said, what's striking about Ru Russian uh, defense spending today is that it's now in the league of the United Kingdoms and France and completely dwarfed by that of uh, the United States uh, and of China. The United States accounts for 40% of total world spending on defense. 
the China accounts for an eighth, 12 and a half percent. Russia, uh, it's 3.1 percent. Uh, the UK and France is around 3 percent, although on some uh, of these analyses, the very respected IISS, uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies, um, we are spending slightly more uh, than the Russians. Now, these comparisons can sometimes be misleading because they don't necessarily take account of spending power within those countries. And a, a truth, as we're seeing, is, is that um, the, the Russians believe in having a lot of boots on the ground, but they don't pay them very well and, and they don't train them uh, very well. But it is, uh, I think, really salutary to think, think about that. Now, um, Putin, uh, and I was going to c carry on to, on to say that with Putin, no aspect of his nation's humiliation has been more psychologically wrenching than the loss of Ukraine, which he claims is a fu fundamental part of a mother Russia and which has never had a distinct, separate Ukrainian national identity. This is a, an historical view which is not shared by most Ukrainians, in a, including a significant number of those in Ukraine who are, whose first language is Russian. And in the east, not just in, in those two uh, eastern provinces, but in the east of, of the Ukraine, a lot of people speak Russian as their first language. In the west, most people these days, it wasn't always true, uh, speak Ukrainian. But that historical view about Ukraine being part of the soul of mother Russia is one which is shared by many Russians. So Putin is obsessed about restoring Russia's greatness. He's also shown increasing paranoia about what he sees as a growing military threat from NATO, uh, particularly those on his West members on its Western border, the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria. However, the real threat from those states and indeed from the Ukraine is in reality much less to do with some military threat in his imagination that suddenly all these NATO uh, countries are, are going to invade Russia or undermine it militarily, which is for the birds, but much more to do with the governmental systems which these uh, countries, newly released uh, from the yoke of the Soviet Union, have adopted. And those systems, however imperfect, are those of democracy, of free elections, and of independent judiciaries, which mock the Putin system of governance. And Putin's fear is that those ideas, because they are really dangerous, uh, democracy is a very, very dangerous idea, which is why in the early 19th century it was tr treated as, as virtually seditious uh, in this country. Um, he fears that those ideas could become contagious in Russia, threatening to pull down the undemocratic kleptocracy which he's created. To deal with this threat, we know that Putin has systematically removed one freedom after another in Russia. So political opponents are jailed or poisoned, or at a minimum, disqualified from election. And progressively, he snuffed out all sources of information which are not controlled by him. Which is, in my view, a sign of very great nervousness and weakness on his behalf, not of, of strength that he's willing to have his position and his arguments tested uh, by others. Now, Putin's public argument about Ukraine was that this was to deal with a military threat to Russia's integrity and to restore Ukraine to Mother Russia. And as we know, uh, notoriously, he argued that, uh, that Ukraine was under the control of neo-Nazis, including that well-known ju Jewish uh, neo-Nazi, uh, President Zelensky. Uh, and he also implied that the Zelensky government did not have popular support. But the other reason uh, I think Putin invaded, given his, his world view and his view of Russia, uh, was because he felt that he could. Um, the reaction of the West to his annexation of Crimea in 2014 had been very muted. And that was also the reaction uh, in the east uh, of the country, in the Don Donbass and uh, Luhansk regions, um, which in, in neither of those cases, there were protests, there were sanctions of a sort, but nothing much, and life went on. And there was no really serious uh, Western uh, campaign uh, against those interventions. He'd crushed Chechnya by scorched earth policy, and he'd adopted similar tactics in Syria 
and particularly in Syria, the consequence of uh, his approach in Syria was both to restore the Assad regime, which uh, prop, prop up the Assad regime, which he wanted, and also to put Russia on the map once more uh, as a serious global power. Um, now, but part of Putin's problem, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a serious problem, I mean, I even saw this in democratic government here, and I'm sure Alexander did, that if you're in power for a very long time, even with the checks and balances of democracy, it's very easy to start believing your own kind of propaganda. Um, but if, if, I mean, if you're an autocrat and you're jailing all your uh, opponents, um, or, or worse, then um, people are going to start, because they don't like being jailed, they're going to start feeding you information you think you want to hear. And Putin, by all accounts, had intelligence which suggested that Ukrainian resistance would be slight and that there would be much popular support for Russian liberators. Um, he was profoundly wrong about that, of course. Those in the FSB, the uh, intelligence service in Russia, who told Putin what he wanted to hear are now under arrest uh, for their crime of not telling the truth. But who can blame them uh, for, for, for not doing so? Russian troops, as we know, are bogged down in, in many areas in Ukraine, and the, the, the Russians have found that they, uh, far from the, the Ukrainian army being at the level it was in 2008, uh, when um, the uh, Donbass and the Hans, uh, were, well, that, that sort of regional civil war was generated by Russians, they spent uh, the last 14 years um, turning themselves, and, and, and again in 2014, and, and the last eight years, turning themselves uh, around and making themselves a serious uh, fighting uh, force. But all, the, the Russians, I mean, however, don't believe that the Russians don't have, still don't have the power uh, uh, to crush uh, U Ukrainians militarily, because they do. Um, but they, if, if they do, they... I think they are gradually facing the nightmare prospect of having to run uh, a nation and a peoples who don't want them. And whether, as a result of their brutality, those who, have, who had some sympathy with Russian aims now have little or none. The other, so Putin got it wrong about what was going to be the reaction, both militarily and psychologically, in Ukraine. He also got it completely wrong about what would be the reaction in the West as he was banking on the reaction in the West being the same as before, sort of shrug of the shoulder, and with a bit of luck, um, that Germany, which has adopted, uh, for reasons I think most of us understand, a pretty a mercantilist uh, approach to foreign policy. In other words, I mean, although not really, not a player, despite its immense wealth and actually very large uh, defence industries, scarcely a player at all and he I think he judged that the with Germany there the EU would continue a tolerant uh, approach to his Putin's excesses uh, and just bear in mind that Gerhard Schroeder who was the Chancellor for many years Social Democratic uh, Chancellor in the Social Democratic Green Coalition when Alexander and I were around um, has been kind been a paid hired hand for Gazprom, and in a sense for the Russian government, uh, for uh, the last decade. Uh, and he no doubt has been feeding Putin uh, reassurance as well. But one consequence of Putin's actions is that Schultz, the new chancellor in Germany, completely reversed overnight uh, Germany's quiescent stance on defence and foreign policy, uh, by which they'd stood certainly since creation of single Germany uh, in um, uh, the early 1990s. Schultz announced a massive increase in defence spending. He's cancelled Nord Stream 2, so that's, that's gone altogether. Uh, and with the exception of oil and gas purchases, a, a big exception, I, I give you, um, but it, it's, it's sort of inevitable given Germany's current reliance on Russia for oil and gas, he's brought Germany and therefore the European Union full square behind the strategy of the United States. So what's going to happen next in, the, uh, in Ukraine? Well, I don't know, and uh, I think few would 
offer any, um, any certainty here, and I think that has to include Putin himself uh, since his uh, military adventure uh, in the Ukraine is not going according to his original conception. Now, it's possible, there's things in the papers uh, uh, and, and on the wires overnight, that in the next few days there may be some kind of accord reached in the negotiations with the two sides. But Zelensky will need to drive a hard bargain to deny what Putin wants above all, which, which is something which he can plausibly say looks like victory. But however much Putin proclaims victory in strategic terms, he's already lost badly. He lost the Ukrainian people. Ukraine is likely to turn even more westwards for its future. NATO and EU membership were always a long way off, which is why I could never understand why Putin kept rabbiting on about how he wanted cast iron guarantees that um, the Ukraine wasn't going to join NATO. I mean, I think it's an out outrage to expect an independent nation state to give those a cast iron guarantee. But the, the rest of NATO is not going to accept Ukraine in, in, into membership for some decades, not least because of the, the, the great risks that, that could be involved. Um, and it may be that in negotiations with the Russians, Zelensky has had to make uh, those prospects of, of, of joining NATO and EU even more distant. But that's not going to stop NATO and the European Union uh, and, and the United Kingdom from increasing their cooperation with Ukraine and their economic and military assistance. Um, Putin has also managed to achieve something he certainly didn't want. He's found a, a role for NATO. NATO was rather floundering, you know, wondering what it was really doing there. Uh, now it's found a role, uh, and the, the West is emerging uh, from this more united than it's been for at least 20 years since immediately after 9-11. Putin will certainly not have improved his standing at home, and it may be over time he will discover he's been seriously weakened, although no one should hold their breath for Putin's demise not least because his idea of the greatness of Russia uh, and Mother Russia is one that chimes chords with a lot of particularly of middle-aged and, and older uh, Russians. But this crisis has also laid out um, an, uh, an agenda for the West to act quickly to reduce our reliance on Russian hydrocarbons. And I would also say uh, on a too great a reliance on the Chinese economy. I mean, the last issue is, did we in the United Kingdom, in the European Union, probably even Australia, go too far in, in cozying up uh, to Putin? Um, well, hindsight's a great thing, um, but I think we probably did. But some people I'm close to um, had foresight on this. This is my last point. On, uh, as part of the cozying up to uh, uh, President Putin, he, was, he came here as... Uh, as um, uh, on, on a state visit. State visits are the uh, top whack for uh, diplomacy. I mean, the red carpet's literally rolled out. And amongst other things, um, as well as being received at horse cards uh, by Her Majesty uh, and various hangers-on, including uh, the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary for, for, for the time, the time being, time, um, you, you also get to ride in an open carriage. Uh, and then there's a, there's a state banquet in Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle and a return banquet, in this case by, uh, 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 the Soviet Union, uh, by the Russian uh, Republic the next day. My wife came with me to both the state banquet and the uh, return banquet. And because we were in, in the uh, top table party, she had a chance to meet Mr. Putin. And on the way back from her second encounter with Mr. Putin in the car, she turned to me and she, she said, I don't know why you're, you think you can do business with uh, that man Putin. She said, I've, I've met him twice now and talked to him. He's got the most evil eyes of any man I've ever met. <laughs> anyway, she was right. Thank you very much. <laughs> My only um, story about Vladimir Putin was when he came to Sydney in 2007 and I thought I would 
um, expressed generosity towards him, wanting to befriend Russia. And so I presented him with this bottle of Grange Hermitage wine, which is one of Australia's two top wines, and it was a magnum. So it must have been worth a thousand dollars, five hundred pounds. It was a really valuable bottle of wine, and I said to him, "Mr. President, I'd like to present you with this bottle of wine, which comes from my own constituency in South Australia, and I hope you'll treasure it." He took one look at it, grabbed it, handed it to an aide, and walked off. Yeah. And that was it. Um, we had lunch, not just me, but the then Prime Minister. And um, I had a bit of the impression of your wife. I thought he was as cold as ice. Yeah. Quite funny, makes quite amusing comments yeah, like yeah. all Russians do, actually. Russians yeah, are very yeah, funny sure. people. But he, um, gosh, he was fairly quiet and, and very cold. I want to, because um, I, I was intensely interested in your comments and your analysis. Um, so following on from what you've been saying, go to something which has been a critique of Western policy, and that is goes right back to the 1990s, to, um, to the end of the Bush the first Bush administration and to the Clinton administration. Was it a mistake to expand NATO to the borders of Russia, including to include Estonia, which are the Estonian border to St. Petersburg is like 125 kilometres. Sure. Um, and did this play into the paranoia that you referred to? But I mean, I think it's steeped in Russian, it's the it, Russian yes. psyche about the dangers of the West, the dangers of the West born out of their, their experience of being invaded by the West over a few hundred years. Well, we, we never invaded them. Um, no, yes, yes. Um, no, not we, well, we, there, was, there was a crime in war, I know. Uh, but, but, yeah, but there was Crimean War, and then there was 1918, 1919. Well, but we, 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 Russia was on the same side. We've only invaded them twice, in my recollection. We, 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 Russia was on the same side as us in the First World War. Mm -hmm. but, um, yes, but at the end, when the Soviets took Oh, uh, well, uh, well, that was slightly different. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, by the way, I, I'll, I'll answer your question, but there's a, a, a factoid springs to mind about Mr. Putin, which um, we should have digested earlier in, in um, uh, how we dealt with him, um, which is that uh, Putin's grandfather was one of uh, Joseph Stalin's chefs. It's absolutely true. Is uh, that right? It's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a great fact, isn't it? It is. <laughs> um, so, well, some when the... Um, Berlin Wall fell, and you had the, the East European states were getting on their feet as independent states, and of course the Baltics states were getting established, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Um, th there was argument, not so much here, but in the United States, um, in, on, in the, the Bush 41 administration, uh, George H. W. Bush, um, about whether we, we should just be rather careful in not pushing the Russians too far. And James Bacon, um, Bush's Secretary of State, argued that um, we should not push them too far and we should have a sort of self-denying ordinance that they, um, we weren't going to expand NATO. And he gave some kind of undertaking, I mean, observation, if you like, because it wasn't a formal governmental uh, undertaking uh, to that effect. Um, others in the US administration, as ever, argued a different view. Um, and it was, in the end, the, the other view that prevailed. I mean, the, the problem, Alexander, um, for us, I mean, I, I, I get in terms of, sort of uh, active governmental diplomacy, I first came to this when I became Home Secretary in the late 1990s, and then uh, when I had a lot to do with the new applicant states, uh, most of which came into uh, the EU in, in 2004, uh, and, and, and were coming into NATO, was that these states wanted to establish their own separate nationhood and identity, and they were scared stiff of Russia. 
for rather good reasons, uh, which was that you know, Russia had kept them under the yoke for uh, decades, um, in some cases denied them nationhood altogether, as they had with, as they had, they had with the Baltic states. Um, and, uh, you know, memories are long. So uh, if you're Hungarian, you have a memory or a folk memory of the tanks uh, uh, going in there uh, in uh, 1956. Um, or, um, I, mean, I remember this, and I'm sure you, of, of um, the same thing happened, happening with the crushing of the so-called Velvet Revolution uh, in what is now the Czech Republic in, in 1968. Uh, and the fact that, of course, Paul and Corrigé les Ort, um, those interventions um, ensured that, um, on the whole, uh, the East European nations were quiescent and, until it became uprisings in, particularly in Poland, became sort of unstoppable. So that was a difficulty. And I, I mean, I've thought about this a lot, not least in, in, in the light of what's happened. But I, I think that um, if I had known then what I know now, I would have, I've still said, these states need to come into, into NATO. Um, uh, be, and also in the European Union, let me say, because the one was was about providing them with um, uh, national security. Uh, the other was about providing them with economic and social security. So I and uh, I mean, R Russia would only be happy. Um, I mean, given their sense of uh, of themselves, if those uh, nations had simply stayed. Under the Russian yoke, and are not the, uh, are not started to challenge uh, Russia's notion of government. I mean, it's just worth bearing in mind that, as with China, um, Russia's had no real experience of democracy ever. It's not how you can, some people argue you can't, you can't run Russia in a democratic way, but leave put that on one side. Anyway, you don't. It, it, Russia hasn't been run in a democratic way, just as in China, it's never been run in a democratic way. I mean, they've had the odd experiment, but very short-lived, and I'm told by my friends who know uh, Mandarin uh, extremely well that there is no word in China, Chinese, uh, for democracy. Uh, it's just taken from the, from the Greek. They, they, so I, th I, I think we basically got, got that right. I think the, the bigger mistake we made, um, and particularly Germany made, uh, was in thinking that if we uh, opened up trade uh, with, with Russia, the consequence of trade relations and welcomed their oligarchs and all the rest of it would be that somehow that would bring them round to our point of view. And uh, that, that's turned out to be nonsensical. So what we've seen with Germany is a, um, a dramatic yeah. generational change in, in foreign policy and national strategy, mm -hmm. which uh, happened in just one speech from yeah. a new chancellor. Although Absolutely. Although he'd been yeah. a vice-chancellor before, yeah. but... Um, so all of the policy of the Merkel and Schroeder years was cast aside. Just, just off. And I don't know if you remember, but when, when um, the um, International Stabilization Force, ISAF, went in to just to act uh, as security around Kabul in uh, late 2001, early 2002, the Germans said they'd make a contribution, but their rules of engagement were basically they had to stay in their barracks. And they weren't allowed out. I, mean, I haven't made this up. Uh, and they, they, they couldn't go out after dark. And I, they, I think they could only shoot if somebody was actually shooting at them at that moment. Um, so it was hopeless. In fact, they were just a, and, and people, even someone like Joska Fischer, who was leader of the Greens and now uh, opposite number um, as a foreign minister, he found this deeply frustrating. But it wasn't explained that it wasn't possible to get Germany out of that mindset at that stage. And although they'd been, they had been spending quite a lot of money um, on their defense forces, um, they'd been uh, decrepit. Um, and then, I mean, it just, it's just worth remembering this, when, when Ukraine, Zelensky asked for help from various Western nations, different Western nations were giving them military assistance, but Germany point blank refused Sun Merkel. And they sent them 
a thousand steel helmets. And it, and, and it was seen and said uh, as, an, as an insult. So um, that's, that's been a dramatic change. Yeah. Um, just, uh, just tell me what you think about the um, way the Biden administration has handled all of this. There's, the, there's an argument, isn't there, which um, we've had here on some of our previous um, evenings, that the withdrawal, the sudden withdrawal by the Americans from Afghanistan, the um, total collapse of Western, but particularly American, power in Afghanistan has sent a message um, which has been compounded by the deep internal divisions in America, um, deep internal, um, incredibly, whatever you think of partisanship here or in my country, it's nothing compared no, no, no. to the intensity of partisanship in, uh, in America. Um, the sort of combination of these things has led autocrats like um, Putin and Xi Jinping as well to become more adventurous. Um, so people say in Reagan, in uh, Ronald Reagan's years, he used to talk, talk about peace through strength, and what we've now got is war through weakness. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got maybe maybe more time for Joe Biden and his administration than have you, Alexander, but however sympathetic you are, um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, was chaotic. There was a case for withdrawing. There was no case for withdrawing in that way. And it was just terrible um, uh, and uh, humiliating. I mean, it, they also, although the, you know, everybody's had dealings with the Afghans, uh, and I had a lot of dealings with them, and spent a lot of time in Kabul and indeed in Kandahar uh, and other places. Um, they are frightfully charming people, the elite, uh, and they lie through your, their teeth to you. Um, so, um, but we, they, um, and we, I mean, the, collectively, the so called international community of the West had been incredibly naive in the way in which it, it had, for example, trained up the um, Afghan army. Uh, and now that, you know, frankly, wasn't my brief, wasn't yours, but somebody in our military ought to have done a kind of audit about where the money was going. Um, because it was, you know, sort of the, the old quartermaster trick. Um, uh, and, and it wasn't going to create a, a, a serious Afghan army, which was equipped to fight the, the Taliban. So I, th I, I think, yes, that, that's bound to have had an effect of um, leading to a sense of schadenfreude uh, by uh, our opponents uh, and maybe um, you know, led to Putin and, and uh, the Chinese leadership just thinking, well, uh, America is now a paper tiger. I, th I think on this issue, on the Ukraine, Biden's done fine. I think it's very difficult to argue that he hasn't. Uh, and uh, in fact, in many ways, Putin's done Biden a great favor by enabling uh, Biden to, to leave the West and, and to create a high degree of unity and also to introduce the toughest economic and other sanctions that have ever been uh, introduced against a, a major country. And there's no doubt they are having a very serious effect. But uh, so... But maybe if um, Putin was unsure whether the Americans would intervene militarily in support of Ukraine, right, yeah. that, uh, I mean, you just don't know that narrative. You just don't. No, you don't. I mean, I've could have created World War Three. Well, course. he could have done, and, and I, I, I've been. It's worth reflecting on how the world sort of almost stumbled into the First World War. Okay, so there was an arms race going on between us and Germany. Um, but you know, relations weren't too bad even. And then Archduke Ferdinand is shot dead on a corner of, uh, of a street in Sarajevo um, by a Serbian terrorist. Um, 
I mean, you know, he, he was a Serbian terrorist. He was tied up with uh, the, the Serbian nation. Wouldn't um, said they were so, sorry or a bit sorry. You know, but, but it was a bit like when my son was was four saying sorry, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, uh, but but um, you know they they and, and they weren't willing to hand over the, the, the terrorists. And only so then one thing after another escalated. Um, but it, but that that was in, in June 1914. But I mean, I don't think anybody th thought when that, when the news of that came through that it was going to be the most horrendous world war lasting for four years, and we suddenly found ourselves stumbled into it. And then, of course, when it, the engagement did take place, the predictions here was that our boys would be home by Christmas. Um, well, they, they didn't, and they didn't mean Christmas 1918. Uh, which is what, and many of them in in uh, in, in boxes or in bits. Mm. Um, so, I think it's. I think if I'd been in Biden's shoes, I would have been cautious about making threats that I couldn't follow through. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's that's the the, the difficulty because, um, I mean, I could still see the West inter intervening there in extreme circumstances, um, if. I mean, they, the, the, the Russians, because of the failure of their ground troops, so, so stark, they're using long-range mis missiles, some of which are fired from Russia itself, and long-range artillery. Um, and you've got to be really careful about ranging it, uh, working out your target. Um, if if some, of, some of those um, shells, missiles, went into Poland, that would will lead, would lead to a reaction. I also think that if there were many more attacks on maternity hospitals and things like that, then you could get um, such uh, an uprising amongst public opinion in the West, in the US, uh, here and across Europe, that there could then be intervention. Um, uh, and it'd be very difficult and to, to, to manage and to handle. That's I don't think it will, um, but you could have it. Um, and that's when the, the dangers of, of uh, nuclear war uh, occur be because of the, the fact that uh, Putin's defense capability is so much less than the United States. I mean, the, and if you then aggregate what's non-US, assets that are available within NATO completely dwarfs um, at Russia's. It then bec becomes attractive and in a Russian mind maybe the only alternative in extremists to use, start to use um, so-called low intensity nuclear weapons but they, they still may cause a lot of damage and then you could really get a conflagration of things mm. spiraling out of control. It's, worth, it's a scenario at least worth yeah. Solemnly yeah. reflecting yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, so the last question I'm going to ask you is something completely different. It's about domestic um, domestic politics. So your party, the Labour Party, yeah. has been in opposition for a long time mm. now. Um, so why, why it, 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 rather than just focusing on Jeremy Corbyn and how particularly extreme and unpopular he was, like, in the 2017 election, he did do quite he well. Did very well. Yeah. Um, what what is in 2022 the great divide, ideological or philosophical division between the Conservatives and the Labour Party? Or could I put it another way? What is the Labour Party's organising principle today that is going to appeal to the public, which is in contrast to the government's? Or, or the Conservative parties, or is it really just a debate about competence that, you know, such and such a minister is incompetent and if we no, were the I, government, we'd do a better job? No, I think, I think there is a, 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 an ideological uh, difference, uh, Alexander. I mean, it, in the 50s, um, much of the argument between the parties was a kind of managerial one, and... It, 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 it was said that, um, I mean, the kind of left of the Labour Party and the, and the left of the Conservative Party and the right of the 
uh, Labour Party were parodies as being uh, those who pursued butkerism, which was a combination of Rab, Rab Butler's, the uh, conservative, uh, nearly leader's uh, view that, that of, of sort of conservatism with a human, human face, and Hugh Gateskill's um, social democratic view. And there was something in that there were, um, at, at that stage. And of course, almost all the leaders of both parties in the 50s had had the ex experience of working together in the coalition uh, in, in the 19, early 1940s very successfully. Uh, and also shared a, um, the, the um, on the whole, uh, sh shared remarkably similar backgrounds as well, um, just in terms of you know, which, which schools they'd been to. There were more old Etonians in, in the Conservative cabinet, in the Labour cabinet, but there were old Etonians in the uh, and there were more Wickhamists in the Labour cabinet uh, than, than uh, in the Tory cabinet, but it was that sort of <laughs> d distinction. Um, uh, not, nothing much more than that. So that, ha what the difference now, I mean, it's partly competence, uh, and um, Mr. Peter has done uh, Boris Johnson a huge favour. Mm. Um, I mean, a, a, a stunning favour. I, I hope he's... Uh, Mr. Johnson feels grateful for this. Um, you know, like, he's like uh, the cavity of the cat. He's, all, he, he's always, I mean, uh, uh, he, he's always finding a way out. Those who say it's like Houdini, it's worth bearing in mind um, that Houdini uh, ended up um, uh, by killing himself uh, with a, a, a trick that went wrong. Um, I don't wish that on Mr. Uh, Boris Johnson, but... Uh, uh, however, I, 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 I pray for his, his political demise. Um, but it's, it's, there is an issue of competence. There is also an issue of kind of sleaze. Um, but beyond that, uh, there's, there's a serious issue, issue about the, the role of the state. And that's at the heart of it, which is that um, the Labour Party believes for a, a, a bigger role for the state uh, and, and using, therefore, a bigger tax take uh, and using that for the benefit of, we would say, of the majority of the people. Um, and I mean, I've, I'm still, I do quite a lot of work in my former uh, constituency, which uh, is, is Blackburn, home of one of the, well, the, 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 one of the, the very first English football league teams. Uh, and um, good answer to a quiz question, because it's, um, uh, apart from the glory teams, it's one of the few teams that has won the premiership, as we did in 1995. Um, but um, I, I, what, I, what I do there is I, I, I chair a large charity that runs, runs a very large uh, purpose-built youth centre. And we have to raise most of our money from private businesses or grants and trusts because um, the, of the way the local authorities' money was cut. So we, we have a budget of 1.7 million. We, we get 10% of that from the local authorities. Have to raise the rest our, our, ourselves for getting a thousand kids a weekend. I'm delighted to do this, and I, I find it really interesting. Um, but by God, there is some serious poverty there. Uh, that's a consequence of the so-called austerity cuts, which weren't necessary. We needed a bit of in, in, in between 2010 and 2015. They really weren't necessary to that. I mean, not not remotely. That was a, a political act to reduce the size of the state. Now, that may be your opinion. And it was with the health service. Um, I mean, the, the health service is facing really serious pressures at the moment, uh, as I know from close relatives who work for it, as a result of COVID. But those pressures were there before anyway uh, because of underinvestment. And when we were in government, we said we were going to invest massively in the health service and we did and that's been cut right back and then plenty else you know the, the i don't know if any of you any, anybody here is a practitioner in the in the particularly in the criminal courts um but or have anything to do with prisons and probation service but it's, it's just outrageous uh, uh the, how i i saw the bar coming to see me i declare an interest by the way i'm a venture of one of the inns i mean i I know and love the bar, but obviously I couldn't always just give them the money. Um, but they weren't badly paid, and it was important that you should have uh, 
criminal barristers who are properly paid, so you get good, both good prosecutors and, and, and good defence lawyers. But that's been badly denuded. Um, the, the, I mean, a, a completely great... I mean, it's my, I'm friendly with Ken Clark, who's in many ways the, the, the archetype of kind of butzkelite uh, uh, politician when it comes to his kind of social attitudes, although he's also, as he will say himself, pretty conservative when it comes to economic policy. But he, there are, Ken, my view is that we should provide sufficient prison places uh, for those who the courts send to prison. And if the numbers go up, that's, there you go, uh, we have to respond to that. Ken's view, was, as a dripping wet liberal, far more liberal than me or, on, on this, was that there were too many people in, in, in prison and therefore the numbers in prison ought to be cut. Um, and uh, to advance this, um, the prison service budget was slashed and about a third of the staff were cut. But they, they, sadly, people carried on committing crime and the courts carried on sending them uh, to prison. So um, you, uh, you had a very inadequately staffed and funded prison service where, in many cases, what they're doing is simply warehousing prisoners um, and, and not trying to re rehabilitate them themselves. And, and the last thing uh, on this rant by me, uh, Alexander, about why, why there's a difference. The probation service, I mean, if, any, if ever there was an argument in favour of the state doing something, it, it is directly, it's over prob probation. Um, it's, it's just, it should not be dealing with um, trying to keep people out of prison but ensuring that they are at the same time corrected and punished uh, seems to me to be a fundamental uh, function of the state. Um, and so, uh, Grayling, what was I've forgotten his name, first name, what was, that? What was his first name? Chris. Chris. Yeah, it's funny how people, but, you know, um, uh, people, you forget his name, but he, by God, he's... The, 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 the trouble he caused has lived on. So he decided to privatise the probation service. And most conservatives, including many friends of mine, knew it was, it was crackers, um, but left him to it. So he privatised the probation service, um, and some fly-by-night companies came in, some entrepreneurial uh, probation officers got together and set up their own uh, social enterprises as running probation services anyway. Um, it, um, a lot of money was spent, it quite quickly collapsed, um, causing a major crisis in probation. And it, 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 to his great credit, Robert Buckland, who was a really good uh, Lord Chancellor, for which uh, success he was fired um, at, at the last reshuffle, uh, he decided he had to bring it back under the state. But it's that, that sort of thing. So it's a whole litany of things. And I mean, in, in education. Uh, Education being more protected than um, other other areas, and um, I think there is something of a, of a consensus between the, the conservatives and us on, for example, the role of academy schools, which I strongly support. But there's still a big issue of investment in education. So that's the, the big divide. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and um, it's just a tragedy that Mr. Edward Miliband. Uh, that was so obsessed about um, killing his brother's chances as a leader um, that um, we've been out of power for 10 years because it all goes back to that. Here we are. We'll just have um, time for a few questions from the floor. So, <coughs> if it... Uh, just a sec, I think we need the microphone so that um, people who are... It's, yes, but people who are listening in online can hear. Yeah. What do you think of the thesis uh, that if we don't fight Putin now, we'll have to fight him two or three years down the road? Or put another way, even if he gets sustains a bloody nose in the Ukraine, what will he do next? Well, I don't... The, 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 <coughs> the problem about... I mean, if you, Say about say NATO intervening is you start a war and you don't know where it's going to end. And the thing about violence is that it's chaotic. You know, 
Mike Tyson famously said, everyone's got a plan uh, which lasts until they get smacked in the face. Um, but I mean, those of you who follow military history, right, they can have lots and lots of plans, but, but uh, organized violence is by its nature really chaotic. And the wars that I witnessed and to some extent uh, helped instigate, and so did he, um, didn't work out as, intent, you know, as intended. Either, uh, so we didn't, ex we, th we thought Saddam would fight uh, and, and he collapsed. Okay. Um, but then we weren't anticipating the, uh, the, the problems that would then arise from a population, some of which actually wanted us there, but we, um, some of which didn't. And I certainly didn't anticipate uh, a most extraordinary boneheadedness by parts of the US administration, which then um, alienated a considerable part of the population of Iraq, uh, which was, had previously welcomed us. Uh, this sort of thing. And you, we, I think you, we have to be really, really careful about not provoking a war. I think that the, the Russians may be, they, they are just different. And the reason that, one of the reasons they beat, in the end, beat Napoleon and also beat Hitler is even, even though the population's been halved, they've got a lot of people. And they're used to, to putting young men in the front line and treating them like cannon fodder. And the, the Russian population is having to put up with it. Um, uh, the populations in the West where we have professional armies um, are not going to do that. Uh, and you, you, we could only get engaged in military action with, with Putin or anybody else if there was a, a very clear cause of war uh, and a clear moral case for what we were doing. Now, there, I mean, there is humanitarian aid in the Ukraine. I think what we're doing up to now is good. But to go beyond that and to start inter intervening militarily now, I don't know where it would finish up. That's the problem. I don't, I don't know others do. Um, we'll just quickly do another. Yes. I know the Director General is looking at me saying time is up. <laughs> um, Jack, if you were still Foreign Secretary, would you be looking for a way without showing weakness and without limiting support to Ukraine for a way to actually help Putin save a bit of face here. It seems to me he's dug himself into a corner and somebody actually has to help him step out. And a second subsequent question, more important in a way, how do we rebuild a working relationship with Russia after all this mess has finished, assuming it does finish, because Russia produces God knows what proportion of the world's wheat supplies, third world countries very dependent on it. So at the end of the day, we're going to have to work together, but obviously we shouldn't show weakness. What's the way out? So, um, well, it's different. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, there's, there's no obvious way out of this without it causing pain to us uh, and, and pain, pain to poorer countries, as we're seeing in terms of uh, increase in commodity prices. Um, no, it's not a good idea to, to, to rub Putin's nose in it, but, but so, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sufficiently involved these days to, to to understand his, his psyche at this stage. I you know some of us thought we did a, a bit ago, but I mean, I'll just tell you, uh, Sergei Lavrov, who I knew rather well and got on with, and uh, Alexander, but as far as I, I've not seen him for some years, but, it, but as far as I can tell, he's a changed man. Um, and sort of iron has been put into his soul. And so, so yes, you don't want to ever, ever to rub your, your opponent's nose in it. It's just, that's just silly. Um, but nor do we want to start laying on a state visit uh, for, for Putin. Uh, um, so, and as for, I mean, this will end at some stage because all wars uh, end uh, at some stage. Um, but I think, and, and 
and Russia will be desperate to sell its we, but I, but I, th I mean, I think we will need to carry on with a really tough policy against them. Uh, not, not you know, we don't want to worst ourselves, but um, we, we, we do need to uh, increase the, the pressure on the Russians. Now, there are some people who say, uh, and there was quite a long essay on the front page of the, of, 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 of the second part of the Financial Times on on Saturday, um, saying that some in the Russian system, including Putin, may actually relish the idea of isolation. Um, and that's an argument. I don't think, I don't think the young uh, will in, in Russia, uh, and nor will the, um, uh, say, the business people, the oligarchs, who, 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 whose money and income depends on uh, trade with the West. So, George, um, uh, I think we have to be... No, so, not go out of the way to humiliate them, but we have to change the terms of trade with Russia and be very hard-faced about it, in my view. I think our time is up, I'm afraid. Um, we've gone um, a little bit over okay. time, Jack, and um, so on behalf of everybody here, can I thank